Hey everybody, welcome back to Deseret Book Live. Today's Wednesday for those keeping track at home. And we're so grateful that you could join us this evening. Yesterday we had John, by the way, give us an inspiring message. I'm so grateful to him. Today we're doing a discussion on mental health. It's such an important thing during this time of social distancing, isolation, and in some cases quarantine for a lot of people. So please stick around and listen to the incredible insights from Wendy Ulrich, a psychologist. Their insights are fascinating and so helpful. So yeah, so stick around and, and listen to their discussion. I think you'll find it really helpful. Um, afterwards, we'll have a giveaway as usual, but for now, I'll turn the time over to Wendy and to Kerry. Well, welcome. We are thrilled to have you join us by way of introduction. My name is Michelle Torsak, and I'm the Director of Content for Deseret Books Time Out for Women. And I am so thrilled to be part of this conversation tonight because it's so relevant to all of us. How to manage our mental health and well-being um, when our world has been turned upside down. And joining me is psychologist and Deseret Book author, Wendy Ulrich, who wrote one of my all-time favorite books titled, Let God Love You. Just one of many of her great books. Wendy has been a psychologist in private practice, a visiting professor at BYU Provo, and she and her husband, Dave, presided over the Montreal Canada mission. And I'm lucky enough to get to rub shoulders with Wendy on a semi-regular basis because she is a speaker um, with Time Out for Women, which obviously is on pause right now. So we're looking forward to the time that we're back at it. But welcome, Wendy. Anything else we should know about you? Um, I am struggling with coronavirus quarantine just like everybody else. Well, I guess not quarantine. Uh, distancing and and staying home just like everybody else is so this is an interesting time isn't it it is such an interesting time well and are you we were talking about this a little bit before but any hobbies you're pursuing right now you know I I'm with kind of the majority of people that I'm talking to who just don't have a lot of energy to do much of anything right now I'm doing a lot of family history because that's something I can do sort of without thinking and so <laughs> It's just kind of this Zen sort of thing for me. And so I'm, I'm doing a lot with that. But uh, other than that, I don't know. I'm just trying to survive like the rest of the world. Like all of us? Yeah. I usually do a lot of knitting and cross stitch and things like that when I'm just tired at the end of the day, but haven't even been interested in doing that. So. In that. Well, this is, that's Good perfect luck. because we, Wendy, we asked um, questions. We asked our audience to provide their questions. And so we gathered your questions um, from an LDS Living poll. And we had so many great questions. We've tried to categorize them because there was lots of overlap. And one of the questions that came up is, is what you kind of just referenced. And it's yeah. this idea of, of being productive. And we don't feel productive. And is that okay? And how can we deal with feeling tired and sad and unmotivated? During such this a, time. Yeah, such a great place to start because I'm hearing that from a lot of people. For a while, I thought it was just me, although, uh, you know, I kind of know better intellectually at least. But the, the reality is that uncertainty is one of the hardest things for our brains to deal with. It's mm -hmm. just tiring. And uh, we are in a lot of uncertainty. Everybody's just got a lot going on right now. We don't know when school's going to start again. We don't know when flights are going to start again, when work is going to be back up. We don't know if we're going to have a job in a month. We don't know. There's just so much that if we're going to get sick, if somebody we love is going to get sick, um, there's so much uncertainty and we can't really just resolve it. And um, so that's a really hard place for our brains to, to function very well. Uh, I've, I've heard that the stock market can handle bad news and can handle good news. What it can't handle is uncertainty. And that's because our brains in general just really struggle with ambiguity and with uncertainty. So I think it's important to remember, it's kind of like there's a, 
there's a part of your brain, kind of the back part of your brain that is constantly scanning for threat anyway. That's its job. And when it can't resolve that there really isn't a threat, there really isn't a danger, which it can't do right now, then it's very hard for that part of our brain to let go. Uh, and it's hard for the front part of our brain, which is really good at decision making and motivation and um, judgment calls and prioritizing and all those things. It's hard for that part of our brain to really fully engage. So it's, it's kind of like a computer when you've got a lot of programs kind of running in the background, at least the computers I grew up with, they would slow down. They just mm -hmm. couldn't, they couldn't speak, they couldn't process quickly. And that's kind of what our brains are doing all the time right now. So we're tired and it's hard to get into the part of your brain that's motivated, that's problem solving, that's um, prioritizing that part is hard sometimes to get kicked in and convinced that it's it's its job is is forefront right now rather than just scanning for threat if that makes well sense. i love that though wendy because what that tells me is that it's normal it's absolutely normal and one of the things that's really well one of the things that's really interesting about this whole situation analogy i heard recently is like it, we're sort of saying well we're all in this t storm together well we're not all in the storm together we we're yeah. on different sides of the storm Th some of us are in the middle of the storm people are you know we love have died or we're sick some of us are on the edges of the storm where our life really kind of is going along fairly normally um, and we're all in different kinds of boats you know some of us are in this storm in a battle cruiser and some of us are in this storm in a rowboat and so it's affecting all of us differently in that regard. Some of us are facing a lot more stress in different ways than others are. But the, do, the thing we do have in common is there is this threat underlying everything that's creating this great amount of uncertainty that we kind of do have in common. And it's, it's stressing us all out to some extent, making us tired and grumpy and all the things that happen when we're under threat. Some people would rather withdraw, pretend that they are just pulling their covers over their head and not deal with it. Some people are going to get irritable. Some people are going to get distracted really easily, whatever their sort of, you know, however they normally run depressed or anxious or whatever it is, is going to get exacerbated and exaggerated. And uh, that much we can all kind of share and say, yeah, this is hard. <laughs> Well, for, and that really kind of leads into this next question because there's lots of people who say they're feeling depressed. They, yeah. they may not always be depressed, but they're feeling depressed and they're feeling yeah. um, lonely. And how, how can we fight some of those things, especially through the lens of the gospel? Especially through the lens of the gospel, it's important that we keep coming back to what reasons we have for hope. Mm -hmm. What are the reasons for the hope that is in us? We don't necessarily know how to get hope in terms of, I hope that this will be over soon, or I hope I can get through the day without yelling at my kids, or, you know, that we, we may or may not have a lot of control over how things are going to turn out. But the, the gospel reminds us that no matter how things turn out in this life, um, they can have meaning, deep meaning. And the meaning that we can put on that is that we are learning, that we are growing, that these are opportunities to live our values. These are opportunities to rely on the Holy Ghost for revelation and guidance. These are opportunities to remember the atonement of Christ makes up for our weaknesses and our sicknesses and our struggles in ways that we can't even fully comprehend. So within that gospel framework, there is great cause for hope. But that hope will not be, oh, uh, the gospel will promise me that, you know, if I just hope hard enough, this will be over soon and everything will get back to normal. Well, maybe maybe not yeah. we, we don't know but whatever it does there's an opportunity for learning here um, so when we are dealing with depression and loneliness well if we're dealing with loneliness by all means reach out this is a really important time to draw on our connections um, whatever whatever we're doing when we're depressed it's kind of like there's a bank account is one way of thinking about it where the resources that we have to meet the demands that we're experiencing um, are feeling inadequate when we get depressed it's often because it just feels like i don't have enough money to pay the bills not just literally but emotionally i don't have enough resources to 
deal with the, the stresses in my life. It can help sometimes to just make the list. Our brains do better when we just have words and names on things. Just knowing I'm not crazy, you know, that the back part of my brain is on overtime looking for threat. Just those words can be helpful. Um, it can help to make a list. What exactly, name it, are the challenges that I'm experiencing right now? What's making me feel sad? What's making me feel scared? Make that list and put names on it. It's making me feel scared that I, I don't know if I'm going to have a job in, in two months. Okay, that's put that on the list. It's making me feel depressed that I don't, I'm not going to be able to have my graduation from college or I'm not going to be able to get married in the temple. It's making me depressed that I don't know whether I'm going to have everybody be able to come in for the funeral if somebody does die, whatever, write down what we have. It's making me depressed that I can't get toilet paper, you know. <laughs> um, but then on another column, what are the resources that I have? What are the things that I can throw at this problem? Maybe I can throw money at it. Maybe I can't. Maybe I can throw time at it. Maybe I can't. Maybe I can throw connection and, and help and support at it. Maybe I can throw my perspective from the gospel of what it means to rely on the Spirit. Maybe I can, can throw a determination to have good cheer. Maybe I can throw gratitude for the blessings that I do have. Sometimes it's been really helpful for me to just ask myself the question, what do I get to do right now? And think about the answer to that. I get to sit in a beautiful place. I get to walk outside. There are people all over the world who don't have those options at all. I get to go to the doctor because I have medical care that's available to me. I get to take medicine for this because this is going to help me. These are blessings that sometimes we think of as sort of curses. You know, I have to go to the doctor. I don't have right. any toilet paper. But if we can think of it in terms of I have options, I do have resources available to me. Let me just make a list of all of the things that I, <clears throat> that I have that are helpful. I love that. That's such an actionable takeaway. And part of my challenge, I think, has been is I heard you say, even identifying what is it I'm feeling. I mean, some of my feelings are all mushed together. And I don't think Absolutely. I even sometimes know, like, what is it I'm feeling? I just know that I'm feeling something. And yeah. I lump it as anxiety. But making that list, I can see that would be so helpful. It does help because as the mush is because it's just the back of your brain that doesn't really have words. that's just saying threat, 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 threat. You know, this is, there's a problem. Stress, threat. Right. And, and once you get into the words, you're up here in the front part of your brain where you have, it's slow slower, it takes time, you have to give it time to, to kick in and to work. But once we can do that, then that's the part of our brain that has solutions, that's creative, that has um, answers and can figure things out. So putting those words on it really does help. So in addition to making the list, what are some of the other things that we can do to limit our anxiety during this time and to focus on hope instead of doubt and uncertainty? Yeah, well, of course, you know, we all have our own things. If you haven't really dealt with depression or anxiety, particularly before, you may not have much of a list. But if you have, go back to those things that you know help you. Um, anxiety is a, is a tricky thing, as is depression in these times, because we want to get rid of them. And you yeah. don't necessarily get rid of them. And then you feel anxious about being anxious. And you get into this cycle where it just gets worse, or you get depressed about being depressed, and it just gets worse. <laughs> so some of it is saying it's okay and normal to be a little anxious right now. I don't have to get rid of it. But what can I do to take the edge off? What can I do to manage it a little better? The physical things are the obvious ones we've all heard a dozen times. Exercise is huge, really, really helps with both depression and anxiety and stress in general to get regular exercise. Lowering our, uh, our uh, incessant input of sugar, which is one of my big ones, and, and refined foods, you know, eating more natural foods and, and uh, lowering the, the carb uh, diet sort of can help. Getting regular sleep is huge, and that's a really tough one for me. I end up, you know, I'm, have, I'm sort of used to being on, uh, on my own a lot during the day, and my husband's around all the time now, which is lovely on mm -hmm. one score, and on another score, I need I, I'm just somebody who needs downtime by myself to think things through. So I end up staying up late at night. Then I end up getting up early in the morning because that's when, you know, not terribly early, but, you know, 
early enough to go walk with my walking partner because I know that's important. And then I'm not getting enough sleep. And that's huge. So getting to bed at a regular time, getting up at a regular time so we're not putting ourselves constantly in time zone lag by changing around when we're sleeping can help a lot. Those are the physical things. Um, being in contact with other people is extremely important. And I hear a lot of people are doing that one pretty well. We're, we're drawn to wanting to check in with people. That does quiet the anxiety because we feel like we've got support. We feel like we've got help. We're not alone. We're not crazy. We check out with other people. Am I figuring this out right? Am I getting the right message? And sometimes that can be a huge help as well. But, you know, we all have kind of our own things that we know work for us. Um, one of mine is just prioritizing and getting things on a calendar so that I kind of break things down and I know what's coming. Structure and routine are really, really important and helpful. Um, but they don't always work very well when things are all in uncertainty and we hear something, we have to respond to it quickly and there go the routines and the structures for the day. Or our kids have a meltdown while we're trying to do our homeschooling and well, so much for that routine, you know, we got to start over. And, and because that prioritizing stuff is, is frontal lobe activity that is very hard, prioritizing is one of the hardest things for our brains to do. Um, it, can be, it can be challenging, but when we can do it, when we can get it kind of written down, it helps. One of the things I used to tell missionaries a lot was just to remind yourself, all I have to do right now is sit here at the table and eat my lunch. All I have to do right now is catch the bus. All I have to do right, I don't have to think about the whole day at once. All I have to do right now is figure out this computer program for my seven-year-old. You know, all I, I, and just slow, break it down, take one piece at a time, and that can help a lot too. Ooh, that's a good golden nugget. What do I have to do right now? Just all I have to do yeah. right this minute is just this thing. What's the next thing that I have to do? And, and combine that with what I get to do right now is figure out this computer program for my seven-year-old. Isn't it wonderful that yeah. I have teachers who care about my seven-year-old <laughs> and that I have a computer and that I have some experience with this that I can draw on and that if I get really desperate, my brother-in-law can help me, you know, reminding ourselves of the resources and the strengths that we have. One of the next questions, and, and, and you can imagine, lots of people want to know, what can I do to help my children deal with their anxiety, and how do I balance it now that you know I have all these people that are sharing my time with me, how do I balance their needs and my own needs? What's your thoughts two, on that? Two really good questions. Um, my my daughter, Carrie Scarta, who is a psychologist and a primary president, gave me a great list, uh, who is doing homeschooling with a, an eight-year-old and a seven-year-old right now, gave me a great list of um, things that she's found really helpful with her kids. One of them is to just name what the child is feeling, put a word on it. Same idea again here, putting words on things. Oh, you are feeling really, really frustrated right now. And I understand that. We still need to work on this, on this uh, worksheet, but let's just take a little break and do some deep breathing for a minute, you know, and naming it, giving them permission to take a break sometimes helps them as much as it helps us. It can also help just at the end of the day to sort of tell the story of the day. You know, let's talk about your day today. What happened today? What did we do the very first thing today? Oh, we got up and remember the heat didn't go on. So we were cold and we had to get um, the, the, you know, a blanket to put around us. And then what did we have for breakfast? And then what, and then we were working on that, you know, and just take them through that, help them kind of create the narrative, create the story for the day um, that helps them make sense out of what's happening. It can help us make sense out of what's happening too. And it's a good thing for us to do at the end of the day to say what was the day today what did I do today at the end of the day sometimes I'm like, what did I do today I, I can't there's nothing believe. to show I, for it I, nothing to show for this day but it helps to just kind of reconstruct that and a friend of mine says she's at the end of the day checking did I do the dailies did I exercise did I limit my sugar did I get to bed on time did I you know she's got a little checklist of things she knows helps but then she spent some time thinking about what was I grateful for today? What were some of the challenges today? And what did I learn from them? 
going, that I could do going forward? And what are some of the blessings I'm aware of today? So she just spent some time writing about that at the end of the day, kind of creating her narrative or her story for the day. And especially looking at what can I be grateful for? What did I see that was good that I may have missed and that is, is part of the blessing in my life right now for all of the difficulties, but also looking at, okay, what didn't go well was really, man, what happened with, you know, with the kids when they just had that meltdown at two o'clock? What was that about? And I was melting down too. And do some learning from that. Okay, instead of just seeing that as I can't do this anymore, I can't stand this. Um, what can I learn? What might I try tomorrow that might do better? Um, another friend of mine with her children at home, and I'll, and I'll, get to one more tip for kids in a second, but she has, uh, she said, my husband and I are a lot of the time spending the day saying, okay, where are you on a scale of one to 10? And one is I am done. I am, I cannot do another thing. I have got the blanket over my head. I am hiding in the corner balling, you know, <laughs> and 10 is, this is really kind of fun. I actually enjoy teaching my kids about wolves, you know, and um, so where am I on that scale? She said, I've learned by watching that if I notice where I am, which I'm not used to doing, um, that when I get to about a three, if I get to a three, I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pull it back together. I, it's going to be downhill from there, and I have got to do something immediately, but the chances are I'm done. I am just not going to be able to pull it back together at all. So I'm looking for the four. When I get to a four, I'm like, okay, if I'm in the three, four range, time to take a walk, time to get a break, time to tell the kids to, you know, time to get a snack, time to go have a prayer, time to do some meditation. It, that may be the time when, you know what, kids? you get to play Minecraft now. You know, I mean, that's the time to pull out whatever you need to do mm -hmm. to get yourself back to a more even keel because otherwise you're going to be heading for trouble. Um, the big guns that my daughter said she has found with kids and has recommended to clients again and again when they are just losing it on a regular basis is to, is to spend 15 minutes with them on every, every day for a week 15 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, uninterrupted time where they get to do whatever they want. There is no scolding. There is no evaluating. There is no, I'm frustrated with you. There is, you can't take it away. You can't lose it. Um, you get to choose, child, whatever you want to do with me for 15 minutes. Now, obviously, if you're a single mom, that's going to be hard to pull off, um, but you may need to see if you can get the other kids engaged with something one at a time and say, each of us will have a turn, but this is Ronnie's 15 minutes with mom, you know, or this is uh, Samantha's 15 minutes with dad, you know, and, and that in a week, it's amazing how much that can help when kids just feel like they, they are reassured, calm down that mom and dad are there and are paying attention one on one with them. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Well, la last question, and this is kind of one of those generic ones. People want to know, what can we do to maintain our mental health, to, to kind of keep it on this steady, the steady plane? Uh, yeah, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> I don't know that there's going to be a lot of steady planing in here. Um, sometimes, though, it's helpful to remember my job is not to master this situation. Yeah. My job is to increase my tolerance for the ambiguity and the uncertainty here. And that's not easy. Our brains like to be in control. They want to be in mastery mode. And to think of it as I'm mastering my my increased tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty is a more realistic place to go than I'm mastering my mental health and everything's going to be even keeled all the time. It's not. We're going to be up and down. Um, I, I, that's part of the reason I like that little, where am I, one to ten? How, you know, <laughs> they just stop and think here, I'm at a seven. Okay, that's not too bad. You know, let's keep going. I'm at a four. Okay, we need to do something. Yeah. Um, and to realize this is a hard thing for our brains, our bodies, even our spirits to comprehend. We're, we're, half of us are looking at it and saying, you know, the only way that I really can feel in control here is to say, I'm just going to get sick and die. I might as well face it. And then at least I know what's going to happen and I can move on. Well, that's not necessarily helpful. Um, 
On the other hand, we can say, everything is going to be fine. There aren't any more problems. In three more months, this will all be over. Well, that's not necessarily helpful either. So dealing, leaving, leaving ourselves in that ambiguous place can be really challenging. But if we can say, no, I can tolerate I can tolerate not knowing. I can tolerate that because I know the Lord does know. He does see the end from the beginning. He will help me through. I don't have to do all of this by myself, whatever it is. You know, even if I lose a loved one, even if I get really sick, even if everything turns out great, but we don't have a job, he will help us. And I don't have to feel like I have to do it all alone. And when we can... When we can do that, we can continue to try, we continue to work at it, but we can do it with a little less anxiety, a little less whining, a little less self-pity, a little more trust that the Lord is with us and we can trust Him. He is trusting us to be able to manage this. We can trust Him to help us. Wow, what a beautiful note and sentiment to end on. Wendy, thank you so much. Your expertise is just so welcome and so needed, and this has been so helpful. Wonderful to be with you, Michelle. Well, and can I tell you, the other thing that you bring to this conversation is you have a gift for calm (laughs) and reassurance, (laughs) and we need calm and reassurance right now. So thank you. This has been absolutely delightful. We, we do need some calm and reassurance. I'm not sure that I'm the epitome of either, but it's, you it's, are. <laughs> I'm glad to know it feels that way. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Wendy. And thank you for joining us. This has been just such a, a fabulous conversation. My pleasure. That's it for today, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It's such an important discussion, such an important issue. Please stay safe and stay healthy during this really difficult time. As for today's giveaway, we're giving away one pair of Time Out for Women tickets. We're also giving three copies of Wendy's book, Live Up to Our Privileges, and three copies of The Power of Stillness. So you know what to do, comment below, and that's how you enter. As usual, tune in tomorrow for a really special Returned Missionary Fireside. We're really excited for it, and hope you guys are too. We'll see you then. Bye!